grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. I ask for a little bit of your patience this morning. The sermon's still kind of a work in progress, just fresh back from continuing it and kind of scrambling to put her together. It may look like uh, around the corners and through the loops a little bit, but we'll try to make some sense of this, but there I think is a direction I do want to go. I think these texts and these readings are much more fitting for the weekend of July 4th and the celebration of the freedom and founding of our nation and our country, but they're still close enough to the event to make it a fresh reading for our times and our eyes. I want to deal with both the Old Testament reading and the Gospel reading because the figures in these stories, set about 500 some years apart historically as events, really have some things in common. And they really do have suggestions or imperatives for our own times in our own nation and our own country. I'm talking about the figures of Amos and John the Baptist. The one thing these two men have in common is that they are voices sent by God from outside the walls of politics, religion, and culture to address uncertain times and the misuse and abuse of power in behalf of people to bring a word of repentance and correction so that all may benefit and God may be glorified and that covenant renewal can happen between God and people. Again, voices from the outside. Amos was not schooled as a traditional prophet. He is taken from behind the scenes as a sheep herder, and he's given words from God to speak to King and to Israel and to the priest. Mind you, in his time, Amos was in a time of decline because earlier in Israel's history, prophet, priest, and king were one in unison to be the voice of God to keep alive covenant for the people that they might faithfully serve God. And it's interesting to me that in the time of John the Baptist, he too is a voice from the outside, raised up by God, and it says in Luke chapter 3 that the voice of God came to John in the wilderness. When you would almost suppose that the word of God would come to the priest in the temple, but it did not. Why? Because the priestly class was so imbibed in religion, there was no room for the word of God to be heard. So God sends his word to a voice from the outside in the hopes that it would rest their attention enough that they might listen and their hearts would turn back to him and he could have his way and his will with people again. Amos is received about the same way as John the Baptist was. And John the Baptist illustrates for us, when you dare to have courage to stand up and to speak truth, you can lose your head over it. But that is the price you pay for freedom, and that is the price you pay for truth, and the willingness to understand that freedom comes at a cost must be part of the repertoire if a people is to remain free. Free in God and free in nation. There is a connection. But back to Amos for just a moment. This humble sheep herder, and he is humble, but when he delivers his oracles, he is a firebrand to the culture and the religion and the kingship of his day. He is sent by God to go to the temple and deliver a word to the king. But he gets interrupted and headed off by the high priest at the time. And before he could even speak the word to the king, Jeroboam, the priest interrupts him and says, why don't you go down there in another area and deliver your words for God? We don't need them here because this is a sanctuary of the king. Now listen to that language with me very carefully. Bethel, where he was sent to prophesy, the name in Hebrew literally means house of God. But it had degenerated to house of a king. And you have the right to ask yourself the question, oh really, which king are you referring to? The earthly king or the heavenly one? but it no longer represented the attributes, the virtues, the character of God. It had become a place of human self-interest in the role of king. And so life began to denigrate or decline for Israel spiritually, 
And Amos said, if you don't turn from your ways and repent, you are surely headed for exile. So the word of the Lord was not heard in the place it needed to be heard, in politics and in religion and in culture. The word was not heard, and the consequences came from the outside. The same was true in the days of John the Baptist as well. The priestly caste and the religious could not hear him and his voice, and neither could politics hear his voice. In both cases, in the context of Vamus and in the context of John the Baptist and the gospel that we have just heard, power was being abused and its implements were running unchecked Freedom was untrammeled because of one thing, the lack of virtue and character in the people who assumed the offices. It's much the same even in our own country today. There's an author I would like to highlight to you for reading sometime who's written a number of books. He's British in origin and birth, and he came to live in our country for what it was. He has been called a cultural social critic, but he's a very deep, profound Christian man. He's become, you might say, a prophetic voice to the culture of the nation of a day. He bleeds for America. He bleeds for our country and its nation, losing its foundation and its moorings in God. He puts through what he calls the golden triangle of the way things are through the lens of history, through the lens of time, through the Word of God, and projects what's needed for a turnaround spiritually in our nation. He calls it the golden triangle, and it goes like this. Virtue requires faith. Faith requires freedom, which requires virtue, which requires faith, so on and so forth. He documents in his book a time in our country back in the 1930s where there was a sudden realization, almost like a discovery, if you will, of our Constitution and our Bill of Rights. And he said, whenever that happens in a republic or in a nation, it means that something is going on that's becoming awry. Even in our own time, there's a call for return to the Constitution. It's almost like there's Constitution and Bill of Rights police out there. We need to get back to that. We're losing something here. Our nation is being gutted because we're not paying attention to this. Now, it's an effort that I applaud, but it misses an important ingredient that our founders built into the foundation of our nation and our country. The missing piece is virtue or moral character, if you will which has so easily been dismissed in our own culture as something now to be confined to the private arena. It has no place in the public arena because it's perceived as something that constrains freedom. But freedom that un is unchecked always leads to the ultimate abuse of power and selfish interests. And the other problem with it is there's virtue also needed in its citizenry. People like you and me that make up the citizenship of a nation like ours. If virtue, what we call habits of the heart, under God and in Him and abiding Him, do not run free in our lives, we will not choose leaders that need to be the same. The leaders we choose will mirror our own lack of virtue if virtue is not first and foremost habits of our heart. These are the kinds of things that Amos and John the Baptist were calling for in the leaders of their day. I remember it was 1976. I was a student in Bible college at the time, and it was July 4th weekend, 1976, as our nation celebrated its 200th birthday and anniversary. I don't specifically remember the event except it being a large, massive worship service somewhere out there between the border of North and South Dakota. It was massive. There were hundreds and hundreds of people present. And here was the text of the day for that sermon. It comes from 2 Chronicles 7.14, and it's really the answer of God directly to Solomon in his prayer for God to come and inhabit the temple that he had just built. Here's what God said to Solomon. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. We need a healing in our land today. There's racial division and strife. 
Culture wars are fully aflame. Leadership is being called into question. In fact, I would suggest this is what seems to be going on in our culture. We have settled for leadership demanding from it competence, but we have not called for character in our leadership. You cannot just flaunt a constitution out there as important that we're losing it. Something more needs to be added to it. Our founders said there needs to be virtue in citizenry and leadership at the level of constitution where both are in union. We've lost some of those things in our day and our time. But I'm not just sitting here trying to dump doom and gloom on you by saying these things. But there is a warning or a call for a change that needs to be said. It's the price we pay for our freedom. It's the price we pay for living in peace. We're so caught up in our day and our age, worried about wolves at the door, when really the problem is termites in the floor. The termites being the lack of virtue or moral character and renewing life and citizenry and leadership at that level. The last thing we need to do is sit and be bitterly critical of our leaders in legislature, in courts, and in presidency everywhere. They need our prayers way more than they need our criticisms. It's okay to say amen to that. They need it. We are directed in Romans chapter 13 to pray those who are in authority over us that it may go well with us, even if it seems at some levels and in some places there's a lack of moral virtue and, and character. What I think is needed is what is stated in 2 Chronicles 7.14. We are at risk. We aren't fully here yet, but we are at severe risk for decline first of all from within before it comes from without. The termites in the floor thing is a return to God and a return to a covenant with Him, a covenant of renewal and grace and fully walking in the virtues that He turns loose within us. It begins at the fundamental of union with Christ and His Word. I still remember the words that Jesus said in John chapter 8, somewhere around verse 26 when he was addressing the religious leaders in front of him. He said this, he said, and it's interesting because it's just like the gospel reading today. You seek to kill me because my word makes no progress in you. Did you catch that? My word is making no progress within you. That's the point where moral virtue and character is revived and becomes real and overcomes selfish interests in sin and does what it does in behalf of not just oneself in the office, but in behalf of those with whom we lead. That goes for religion, that goes for politics, that goes for culture. Only then can a republic be sustained if virtue, virtue itself could not do the job alone, constitution or law could not do the job alone. It needs the moral virtue character of its citizenry for it all to really work. So really in the call this morning, the call I make, and this is where I'm going just in my own personal life, I'm praying for my leaders. This is a problem bigger than them. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than our country. We need a visitation from above. Like Solomon heard from God, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, that's repentance. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins, and then I will heal their land. The fundamental healing of the land begins first of all with its people, and then it spreads and seeps and reintegrates itself back into culture and society. We need that process to happen, not only for the sake of our nation, but for the people that God wants to reach, heal, save, and forgive. There may be Amos's and John the Baptist present in this congregation this morning that God is waiting to raise up. I hope they hear the call. I hope they hear the cry. I hope they listen to the voice of the one who wants to use them to speak a word to our culture, our world, and our nation today. Well, that's about the best I can do with minimal preparation, but I hope you got something out of it, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for our leaders everywhere this morning. 
We need them to be in alignment with heaven and God's purposes not only for a republic, but the world and its citizenry and its churches everywhere. We pray for revival, O Lord, across our land. May there be a mighty visitation from heaven above where the church is reawakened to virtue and character and its citizenry once again call upon its leadership to function with a level of character and integrity that will keep our nation from decline and from losing out God's intention for its destiny and its purpose. We need you, O oh God, and we humble ourselves before you. May your people begin to pray and seek your face as you direct. In Christ's name, I pray, amen.